Welcome viewers and listeners to CHP Talks uh, here with a repeat guest, Mr. Brian Atherton. Brian, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely, Rod. Happy to be here. And uh, uh, those of you who heard our first uh, interview might remember uh, some of these facts, but uh, for those who didn't have that privilege, uh, I'm going to introduce Brian to you. Uh, Brian has lived in the greater Bulkley Valley area since 1979. He was first in the Hazeltons for 17 years and since 1995 in Smithers. He retired in 2009 from a 37-year career with the BC Forest Service, mainly focused on wildfire management. He's married to Carla. They have four adult children. They raised their family with the belief that all of us have a responsibility for the social and economic health of the place we call home. And that's a great uh, philosophy, Brian. Uh, to that end, Brian has volunteered for many organizations over the years, from parent advisory committees, Chamber of Commerce, Two Mile Community Association, the director of the Royal Canadian Legion, Rotary Club. And over the past 10 years, he's been deeply involved with the Bulkley Valley Rod and Gun Club. As a former president of the Rod and Gun Club, he was part of a team that moved the club forward from 90 to 350 members. Shooting sports and hunting have always been very important to him. He's become very disappointed, as many of us are, in a government that seems to care more about optics than about taking effective action to solve root causes of the issues that plague parts of this country. He stresses the need to preserve existing privileges that we as citizens and responsible firearms users currently enjoy. So again, Brian, thanks for being with us today. And we, we want to talk today, well, we can range over uh, any aspect of uh, firearms uh, ownership and safety, but specifically about Bill C-21 that has had a, a, a bumpy ride, and I'm glad it's had a bumpy ride, uh, but uh, maybe you could tell our listeners if you want to give a little background to what Bill C-21 is, how it came to be where it's at and uh, where you see it going. Thanks, Ron. I, I think most people probably would be familiar with BC-21 at this point. It's been in the news quite a bit. And I'll just interject, if uh, the viewers see me wince from time to time, I broke a rib a couple of days ago, and uh, if I move the wrong way, I experience significant discomfort during that. So if they see a little hitch in my speech, there's a valid medical reason for that right now. Yeah. It's Bill C-21, when it was introduced a couple of years ago, and of course, anybody who's a citizen of Canada and has been a firearms owner knows and fears a liberal government. They seem hell-bent on uh, the optics of um, taking measures against violence, death, misuse of tools, whatever those tools are, and uh, they introduced things like Bill C-21. They had long gun registry uh, some years ago, and of course uh, that got uh, taken out by the Conservative government as it was proven to be very ineffective for the law-abiding, uh, well, for the law enforcement people, and of course all it did was pose an imposition on those who follow the law. I've always maintained that what we need in Canada is in fact enforcement of the laws that we have. We don't need more laws. We have lots of laws. Bill C-21 was just another example of the federal government um, playing up to the urban voters, making it look like they're doing something against crime and violence with firearms, while at the time penalizing those of us who are law-abiding responsible. I've always said for, for those people who own uh, a lot of firearms, and of course that can be for hunting purposes, for collection purposes, sport shooting, farmers' protection of wildlife. Anybody who breaks the law has a lot, any law-abiding citizen who breaks law has a lot to fear uh, from law enforcement. And so we follow the law very closely and we have great laws. If you have a history of illegal access to firearms and a history of illegal use, well, I mean, you really have no fear because the law can't take anything away from you. Um, those of us that do own these things legally uh, legitimately can fear that the government is taking away uh, or can take away from us. So I hope that gives a bit of a snapshot, Rod. Yeah, so C-21 
it seems like uh, anytime there's a, an incident involving uh, firearms, uh, the government jumps in and, and you know, they want to reassure people that they're keeping them safe. So they, they clamp down on some aspect. And I think the original bill named a whole string of uh, uh, what they called military style assault rifles. And correct me if I'm wrong, but in the fall, they added handguns uh, to Bill C-21, kind of uh, as a, a last-minute amendment. Or, well, it's really not last-minute because they're not done yet, but but they threw it in kind of after the fact, after the Parliament had already been moving forward with this, and also uh, a provision that would have made it illegal uh, to own something like a Lee Enfield 303 uh, is a standard rifle that's been around for a long time. Many people have them uh, and other many other popular hunting rifles that anything that could take a, uh, a clip or a magazine that would hold more than five cartridges. And that seemed to be a stumbling block, even for, even for some of the NDPers, uh, because they found out they quickly found out from the, the people in their communities that, hey, uh, you're making my hunting rifle illegal. Is that sort of your perspective of it as well? I think it's a fairly good summary, Rod. Um, as always, it just seems the liberal government and the rush to be appearing to doing some good, uh, they don't do enough consultation. They don't think it through. They don't realize the depth of the subject that they're dealing with. Um, there's some very knowledgeable people in the firearms community, uh, and whether it's groups or organizations like the Canadian Shooting Sports Association or the Canadian Coalition for Firearms, right? There could have been a lot more engagement so that Canadians could have worked together with the government to see where we can make changes that it would be appropriate and uh, help curtail some of the illegal or misuse of firearms. I think most Canadians know now because we've all watched what's been going on in our cities and municipalities. Um, there's been a real shift in the last couple of years. There is so much, um, Nate, I, I don't know, Rod, how to describe it. Our society seems to be falling apart and the Liberals just seem to throw something up the flagpole. You know, if we take all the guns away, we won't have violence. Well. I, I know I've done my part, many others have done their part in contacting, you know, their MP or their local MLA, talk about root causes of issues. So why, if we are seeing firearms violence, what's the root cause of that? And of course, most people I think who follow the news know that um, the drug trade is a big problem. Mental health is a big problem. Addiction is a big problem. So if we spent money on root causes, as opposed to the flashy headline things, you know, that we're taking firearms away and that will automatically transition to less violence in our society. I, I think that's, uh, that's a false start. Yeah, in fact, in British Columbia, uh, they've gone on from uh, marijuana to uh... Uh, you're going to try it out for a couple of years, allowing every kind of uh, what we have previously considered illegal street drugs. Uh, you could possess heroin, morphine, cocaine uh, without, any, you know, uh, with, without a criminal record. And these are some of the things, I mean, mind altering drugs, uh, personality altering drugs, uh, mm -hmm. people in a hopeless situation living on the street. And, and these are certainly the kind of uh, preemptive conditions or, or, you know, preceding conditions that can lead to, you know, violent actions. I mean, uh, when people don't understand their purpose in life, they don't have a purpose, they don't have a, a job to go to or a reason to get up in the morning and uh, do something useful, often, well, they say that, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop. So I think... It's it's true and and broken homes. There's all kinds of uh, things. Violent uh, uh, television programming that that and video games that kind of lead people in a different direction. Um, but certainly, the safe and legal possession of firearms has not been proven to be uh, the cause of violence. It certainly a firearm like any other. Uh, tool can be misused and of course the firearm can be misused in in a dramatic fashion and and so we uh, we agree that 
they should be safe, uh, that firearms ownership should be reserved for those who can safely use them and demonstrate that usage. But to just start uh, seizing firearms, taking them away, uh, doesn't seem like an answer. They, they talk about harsher penalties, but at the same time, this uh, liberal government seems to have a soft on crime approach when it comes to actual violence. And uh, there's people getting out of jail, you know, after serving a short time who have committed murders. And sometimes they go on to commit other murders. So it seems like they're looking at the wrong end of the problem here. Well, Rod, one of the nice things, you know, I really want to give credit to uh, the citizens of Canada who are actually standing up. They've obviously made a lot of noise to their member of parliament and to the credit of the member of parliaments themselves, whether they're NDP and even some liberal members of parliament, they've recognized that, you know, we've really jumped way ahead on this thing. And we've tried to ban something without proper analysis, uh, without proper understanding of what the repercussions are, the repercussions for the law abiding. Those who break the law or have a history of breaking the law, there's no more repercussions for, for them than there ever has been, which seem to be few and far between. Buyback programs, uh, things that cost the taxpayers a lot of money through this liberal government, there's many of us feel, and I pretty sure I could easily convince a lot of your listeners, we could spend a lot more money on access to mental health treatment, on access to rehabilitation, uh, support to get off those very drugs that the government is making more available. Now, that may help stop some of the drug deaths that we're seeing. And in British Columbia, I can't speak to the rest of the province, I know we lost over 2,000 people last year um, to tainted drugs. Uh, compare that to how many people we might have lost from firearms violence, and and the scale is is there's no there's no comparison whatsoever. So we do need to spend way more money um, on mental health treatments and addiction treatments and prevention of getting involved in those things, and that in turn will result in lower violence rates. Um, I I pretty much stopped watching the news broad because it's so sad to see what's going on in some of our streets. Listening to some of our mayors who are reaching out in desperation to their liberal, I'm sorry, to their provincial and federal leaders to help curtail the problem that's going on in some of our cities. It's just ridiculous. So um, congratulations to the people of Canada who stood up against this and keep writing those letters and keep calling your MP and let's focus the energy and the limited fiscal resources we have on working the problem, the real yeah. problem. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's easy to get discouraged um, because often we write to our MPs about various things, MPs and MLAs. And uh, sometimes it seems like those letters you know, just go into an empty mailbox and, and we don't get a response or certainly we don't see a change. But in this one, I think the response is, uh, from the public has been so dramatic and so overwhelming that they can't ignore it. And and it it is an encouragement to us. Actually, another one that, that came up recently is this MAID, the Medical Assistance in Dying. Um, and And they were going to begin applying that to uh, the mentally ill, and uh, I think they got enough feedback on that that they decided that might not be such a great idea. So, so they've postponed that at least. But there's a couple of examples where public involvement, public feedback to members of parliament actually uh, uh, made it made an impact. And I think people have they can't uh, get whatever. Uh, uh, unfocused they have to stay on this you know like just getting their attention once isn't going to be enough you have to stay with stay with it and and we should actually be thanking our members of parliament when they do something right uh seems like sometimes that's few and far between but but we should tell them when we appreciate them doing the right thing well and rod i made a point of calling uh, my local MP, mp's office and i wrote them a letter or phoned Uh, and thanked him very much for standing up in Parliament and speaking on my behalf. Because one of the things I have said to him is I expect him to represent his constituents, not Ottawa's constituents, not about some crime going on in the United States. I expect him to represent the people who put him in office and that he needs to stand up for us. 
And to his credit, in this case, he did. Now he needs to keep that focus and realize that um, these deals they're making with the Liberal government, they've got to be good for his constituents. And he needs to, you know, beat the drum and howl and uh, get more money for more treatment centers here. And I believe he's actually trying to do that. We, he and I did talk about a treatment center they're trying to get opened in Terrace. Um, that's all those are starting points. And Rod, coming right back to the uh, the whole firearms, I'm going to say confiscation because I am a handgun owner. I've been a handgun owner for probably 43 years or so. And uh, it's something that I would like to pass down to my family. But the way the current law exists or when it's finally in place um, or through the order in council, I won't be able to do that. And so I have um, legally purchased... Um, items that the government is eventually going to take away from me. And the other thing I've impressed with our M member of parliament is all of these things, these nails in the coffin of legal, legitimate, responsible firearms ownership. You mentioned in your intro that a number of years ago, I was part of the team of people at the Rod and Gun Club that took it from 90 members to 350 members. Now we're going to see the opposite because so many people, you, you can't buy a handgun now. So there's a reason for you not to belong to a shooting range, for example. If you had a restricted firearm, such as uh, some of the semi-automatics or even the hunting rifles that you mentioned, if those truly do get banned, they won't need to be members of a rod and gun club either. So these are going to be very difficult for our small organizations. And the shooting ranges in Canada are routinely used by the federal fisheries officers, the RCMP, the sheriff services, parks, private security firms that use firearms, such as armored car carriers, that sort of thing. So we need these ranges around the country, not only for the enthusiast and the hunter, but we need them for our agencies that are also out there uh, working on our behalf. Yeah. And I know last time we chatted, Brian, uh, uh, how passionate you are about training, about safety training for young people particularly, but uh, for anyone who is interested in getting into uh, shooting sports or has a reason to possess a firearm for hunting or whatever. And, um, you know, I think that's the that's the big key that needs to be understood. And, and uh, I know as a very casual uh, firearms user that uh, it takes practice to be good at things and it takes practice to be safe at things so um i think that i that focus on training is really important and and you showed us around at the rod and gun club some of the uh ways that you do that training conduct that training some of the people the school children who have come in and uh, become uh proficient in in the safety safe handling of uh, firearms so you know, kudos to you and, and to the Rod and Gun Club for that. Rod, when we uh, take a grade six student who's never handled a firearm before and we initiate them through, you know, some training so they get the idea of the safe, responsible use. And then we set some paper targets out there so they get to see, you know, where the firearm is actually shooting, how they're doing it. We get to correct um, their aiming technique, whatever. And then when I set a golf ball out there at 40 meters and they can shoot that off a stump, oh boy, the joy. <laughs> I couldn't believe how happy this one or two people in particular, they were just over the moon happy for what they did. Yeah. And that's just it, Rod. In, in all of the sports, like whether you're shooting hoops and getting a basketball in the basket, whether you're scoring in soccer, hitting a home run, the shooting sports does the very, at least for me anyway, does the very same thing. If I can knock a bottle cap off the top of a post at 100 meters with a 22 rifle, um, I get some pretty good satisfaction out of that. Yeah. And the other thing is, and I honestly see no harm in doing that. So when uh, a government, my government in a democratic, democratically elected government, uh, tends to do this overreach. They look at things going on in the United States. They look at some individuals um, doing very bad things. And again, it's individuals. It's not rampant across Canadian society. 
And I think we need to keep focusing on some of the things you talked about. We need, we need to educate young people in being good citizens, as you talked about in my intro. I really believe with my children that we're all responsible for the economic and social health of the community we live in. And you do that by volunteering. You do that by, pardon my wince there, you do that by picking up that little bit of litter on the street that everybody else walks by. Yeah. It's all part and parcel, ethics, responsibility, um, being kind to your fellow man, et cetera. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so the, uh, the hateful provision or amendment to uh, Bill C-21 that was, was withdrawn having to do with, um, you know, hunting rifles uh, that really, really got in people's face and really got under their skin, uh, that's been withdrawn. But the uh, prohibition on handguns or transfer uh, of handguns is still a part of this bill. Do you see uh, any likelihood that it may be withdrawn as well? Well, there's no question in my mind, while we have a liberal government, that won't change. Um, there's no question in my mind, the amend amendment amendments to be Bill C-21 will be reintroduced in a, another manner. Uh, but I think the the people of Canada, I mean, they've listened to this prime minister. They've seen some of the things he's done and said and how he's behaved and uh, how what I would call is frankly irresponsible he is in his actions. And, and now that they've really been awoken, and I've talked to lots of people who are non-gun owners and they're going, this is crazy. we got the criminals running the streets and yep. we got the law-abiding citizens being, you know, told they have to surrender different things. And, and how does uh, the number of women I talk to that are fearful of the society that we live in now, and we don't want to be in a society like the United States. I've never supported, you know, the, the carrying of firearms. That's not the kind of world I want to live in. But at the same time, the more and more and more we create an opportunity for somebody to be a victim, well, the more the criminals have free hand. And we see this, I believe we're seeing this all the time now. And the politicians are being harassed by local politicians, mayors and municipalities complaining that our streets are going insane. And what what are we doing about it? Attacking responsible law-abiding people doesn't solve anything. Yeah, no, it's... it's uh... It, and it goes way beyond firearms. There seems to be uh, this move towards big, uh, intrusive government, uh, the big brother sort of thing that that uh, is breathing down your neck all the time. Instead of saying, you know, government of the people, by the people, for the people, you know, a government that is made up of citizens like you and me that, uh, uh, you know, has a reason to to exist and functions basically <laughs> a government should have very limited things that it does. It it we don't need a government to do everything for us because I think they say a government that will do everything for you is big enough to take everything from you, and uh, that's sort of what we what we see. Um, what would people do, or what what could and should people do to um, at this point in time to protect their right to? legally possess and safely use firearms. And I might as well say for, for all private property, because firearms is a form of private property. And, um, but, but we're at risk of losing lots of other things. There's, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, types of light bulbs that you can, you can use uh, the type of car that they, they're talking about wanting to make, you know, everyone use uh, an electric car, even though they don't have the uh, <laughs> the electrical plug-ins for it or the power to uh, supply. Um, but firearms is one. And at this stage of the oh. game with Bill C-21, it's still being discussed in Parliament. What do you think people should do to make sure that the government doesn't go farther than, it's, uh, than it already is planning to go? Well, certainly people need to stand up and be noticed, and you can do that by taking, and I know our firearms courses, the firearms training courses here, so that you can own a firearm, period, in Canada. Most people in Canada realize that you cannot possess a firearm unless you have gone through a training session 
uh, past that session and been vetted through the RCMP. So you have to have that sort of permit to start with called a possession and acquisition license. So even if you don't have one, take one of the courses, be familiar uh, with firearms because, and I've always said it here in our local rural community, um, if you if your children are going to a house, a farmhouse, your buddy's, your son's buddy is a farmer's son, and you go to that house, and there may be firearms in that house, it's handy that young people know everything there is to know about safe, responsible use. So taking a course is one of the things. If you were or are a PAL holder currently, make sure it doesn't expire. Make sure you reapply in the in the manner of which is set out. Uh, time-wise and send your $100 or $10 or whatever it is and keep your possession acquisition license current. Another one is join some of the organizations that support safe, responsible firearms use. So if you have a rod and gun or a fish and game association or a shooting range in your community, uh, make sure you join that so that you're part of a growing movement. And we're finding more and more ladies um, are doing that very thing. You know, they're taking the course and they're joining some of these clubs and organizations. So there's your local organization and there are Canadian wide organizations as well. So the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, the Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights, all these are organizations that are standing up for the millions of Canadians who are the law abiding citizens. So join those. And then lastly, make sure you know your MP, your MLA. And provincial uh, legislatures also in BC here anyway, they have dipped into the whole looking at what laws they can uh, incorrectly think will make some changes. And again, I'll say it to I'm blue in the face, we don't need more laws, we just need to enforce the ones we have. Uh, but make sure your MLA and your member of parliament know you. And the important thing there is you can't come off as a wing nut, you got to come off as a reasoned a responsible, ethical person and express your concerns about things that are being taken away from you, and that's rights and privileges uh, for no good reason, and focus, implore upon them to focus on root causes of issues. Rod, I was, when I was working, I was a member of an accident investigation team. And when an accident occurred, you didn't just look at that particular few seconds of the event you look at everything that led up to that what was the root cause whether the person was tired whether there was improper maintenance on that particular piece of equipment uh, was the sun in his eyes whatever it wasn't just that somebody drove off the road there was a sequence of events that got there so we need to look at root causes, where there is firearms violence, where there is criminal use, and we need to have appropriate sanctions for people who break the law. Turning somebody loose after his third time he's been caught, prohibited to own, owning firearms, and he's caught again and again with the firearm, and yet we turn him loose again. Yeah. And Women of Canada, you have nothing to fear. The police are there. The police are doing an excellent job. It's the lawmakers. It's the judicial system. It's our fearless leader, Prime Minister Trudeau, who is changing things that is to the detriment of all of us in Canada. And people need to stand up. Yeah, very good. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, just for our listeners, uh, want to just mention that the Christian Heritage Party, uh, we affirm that uh, self-defense is a basic human right. Citizens should be permitted to possess and use firearms within the limits of reasonable law uh, for purposes of hunting and sportsmanship and or defense of family and innocence. Uh, we assert that the federal government must not restrict the right of law-abiding citizens to own firearms, whether for sporting use or self-defense. Uh, hunting. So that's our, our position. And uh, I, I think if there were proper uh, other things in the country, we're not going screwy in terms of uh, people's uh, respect for others. Uh, and that's, that's the basic thing. I think my dad taught me when I was quite young, just like you mentioned earlier about littering. You know, my dad taught me, hey, you don't just throw your stuff on the ground. You you know, you you pick it up. And, and that stuck with me, you know, throughout my life. Why would you throw something away that someone else has to walk around or pick up, right? You know, that's and just basic right of uh, the right to life that 
we respect others that their their uh, dignity and their uh their safety and their dignity we we you know whether it's how we drive it's how we conduct our business respect for others and if if we all did that if we all treated our neighbor the way we'd like to be treated we wouldn't really need so many laws at all but uh thank you brian for your work uh thanks for coming on this call today in spite of your uh injury we appreciate you uh being willing to tough it out and and go through this interview with us today but thanks for your work with the Rod and Gun Club and all the other organizations you've been a part of and setting an example. We, By the way, my wife and I were privileged to uh, be at the Wild Game dinner the other night at the Rod and Gun Club. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, we, we've been there a few times for that and a great, uh, great event. And uh, one of the many ways that the Rod and Gun Club serves the community. So. Uh, thank you for your work. Thanks for your time. Any final comments you'd like to make to the folks? Well, for those of you listening, I mean, keep the faith. We live in a great country, uh, but it is people that we elect to help govern and guide us and uh, take a look and see what's happening and make sure next time there's an election that you are there to vote and you vote uh, for a government that's going to respect you, the honest law-abiding citizen. Absolutely. Well, God bless you and uh, viewers and listeners. Thanks for joining us today. We'll be back again next week with another edition of CHP Talks. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Rod.